Psalm 96 has this great jubilant atmosphere. I don't know if we got that as we read it together, but look back at it there as it lies on the page. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. And it isn't just that it says that for uh, three lines at the beginning. It goes on saying those kinds of things, doesn't it? Verse 7, ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Then he gets on to creation, verse 11, doesn't he? Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound. I'm resounding a bit, actually, aren't I? Am I? Matthew, have you got a button you can turn the resounding a bit down on? It says, let the sea resound, uh, rather than the sound, <laughs> rather than let the sound system resound. Thank you, that's better. That sounds better anyway. Thank you. It's got an amazing amount of dynamism and exultation, exuberance, you might say, this psalm has. And it's a psalm where everyone is being exhorted to praise God and to tell others about God. Even the creation is meant to be praising God. What's going on? And a question we might often ask ourselves, or you might have asked yourselves at times in the past, does God need our praise? And if he doesn't, when, then why does the Bible, time and again, go on as though he does? Just what is happening here? Have you ever wondered that? Now, I'd, I'd like to try and answer that in two or three ways, with the help of my dear deceased friend, who I never knew, C.S. Lewis, who's worth reading on lots of things, including this topic. I want to quote him a little bit later. But in terms of why we praise God and why we want to tell others about God, why part of our praise is, in fact, speaking to other people about him, as seems fairly clear from this psalm, verse 3. Notice verse 3 there. Declare uh, his glory among the nations. Not just an individual on their own praising God, or even with some other people who all know and worship God praising him. That's happening. But it's also declare his glory among the nations. Why do we want the nations to praise God? What is the big deal about praising God? Well, part, one tiny part of the answer I think comes through this. If you, if you see something that you really appreciate, it really grabs you. For example, now, examples will vary. If you are not totally allergic to football and you see Arsenal play when they're on good form, they play a very pretty, pleasant, rather beautiful form of the game of football. And when they're in a good mood and when they're actually winning, it's a wonder to behold if you are at all open to football. If you see them play and they're really on song, what do you want to do apart from keep on watching that game? What do you want to do, anyone? If they've played magnificently on a Friday night, a Saturday night, what do you want to do later on Saturday or on Sunday? You want to celebrate. And, what, and how do we celebrate if... If our team, if, some, if something really amazing has happened on a football pitch or on some, in some other place, on a tennis court, or indeed, if you've gone to the shops and you've bought, you've managed to buy the most magnificent curtains or duvet or clothes or something really beautiful, something that amazes you, you're amazed at your purchase. I purchased three beautiful books in a series the other day. They were going for only £40, even though each of them is normally £35 each. And when they arrived in the box from Amazon or whoever it was, they were even more beautiful than I thought. The covers were nicer and shinier. They were properly bound, not stuck. And when you opened them and smelt, they smelt like books used to smell 45 years ago. I was delighted with them. When I'd opened the box and got them on the shelf, what did I want to do? Yes, celebrate, but what else? Tell, I want to tell somebody. Esther had to come up. I said, can you come up and look at my new commentaries, please? She had to see them in their beauty on the shelf. I had to share it. 
If your team plays magnificently, you want to tell somebody else. You want to show one or two highlights to somebody else, don't you? We're all like that. We want to share it. Why do half of us go around when everything half decent is happening? What do we do these days? We get our wretched phones out and we start taking photos. Why do we take photos? So that, one of the main reasons is, so that something that we like, we can share with somebody else. We're enjoying it. And somehow, the enjoyment is deepened and completed by sharing it, in effect, by praising it. Isn't this a beautiful photo of whatever? Aren't those books magnificent? Didn't that team play fantastic? That's what we do. In a way, it's part of the enjoyment. Now, that is part, I'm not saying that's all, but that is part of what is going on in a psalm like Psalm 96 that the writer is amazed at God. He or she is appreciating God. And they are then wanting not only to praise God on their own, not only just themselves, they want everyone to know. They want the whole creation to be praising God. And they want that, yes, in some sense for God's sake, and I want to come back to that a bit later, but also, speaking about it, telling others, is part of the appreciation. It's part of the joy of being amazed at this God. Just as enjoying my commentary, uh, telling Esther about them, and her saying, yes, yeah, yeah, really nice they are. <laughs> but at least half sincere, half sincerely was part of my enjoyment of those commentaries. That's part of what's going on. Let's just look at the psalm pretty briefly. I'm, I'm not going through it in detail, verse by verse, but just see the, there is a sort of structure and an overall um, flow to it, really. Um, in verses 1 to 3, uh, the writer exhorts others to sing God's praise. And then in verse 4 to 6, See that next paragraph in our NIV, verses 4 to 6, there's reasons. Reason, some reasons are spelled out. Great is the Lord, most worthy of praise. The Lord made the heavens. See that? So there's praise God, sing God's praise, and then why? 1 to 3, 4 to 6. That's the first part of it. And the particular things that are mentioned in that section as reasons for our praise are God's greatness and the fact that He made everything. He's actually done things. He's made everything we see in the sky has been made by him. The Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, made the heavens. Verse 5. Then you go on, verses 7 through 10, and again, it starts off by, in effect, calling for praise. This time, Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to him the glory due to his name. It's not exactly the same thing as sing, but it's the same kind of thing. It's saying give God what is appropriate to him. He deserves praise and worship and honor. He deserves that everyone should realize how great he is and that they should show that realization. They should manifest verses 7 and following. You see that? So, again, it's in effect a call to praise, just slightly differently worded. And, and he's addressing it here, not just to the people who already know and believe in God. He's saying, all you families of nations, the whole world. Right? The first section, 1 to 6, it was, seemed to be particularly to those in Israel, presumably, who already know him, but telling them to declare among the nations. Now, it's talking directly to the nations, or wanting to. All families of the nations ascribe to the Lord these things. See that? And again, you have reasons, implied reasons and overt reasons. Verse 10 is reasons, isn't it? Say among the nations, the Lord reigns, or that could be translated, the Lord has become king. He has taken charge. 
may well be a reference to his kingdom, his saving kingdom that started in Israel with David, but in the end there would be a greater one than David coming of his line who would have an, a universal saving kingdom. And that, the phrase there, reigning, may not just be reigning as creator, but reigning as savior. The Lord reigns or the Lord has become king. And part of that is the last verse, the last line of verse 10. He will judge the peoples with equity, which it doesn't just mean condemnation. It means sorting things out. In the end, putting things to rights across the world, righting all wrongs, and liberating all who are oppressed. So again, so in 7 to 10, you've got praise God and you've got some reasons. This time particularly reasons to do with God's saving kingdom starting to come on earth, starting in Israel and then coming through David's great David's greater son, the Lord Jesus, who was at that time yet to come. And the fact that God is at work in the world in certain ways already beginning to restore things to their right places and their right relationships and beginning to set people free, 7 through 10. And then the last section, 11 to 13, you have the same pattern. You have exhortations to praise. This time it's to the, to the creation, not just to the people. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad, the sea and all that is in it, the fields and everything in the fields, the trees of the forest. In a later psalm, he's going to talk about rivers clapping their hands and, and um, mountains singing for joy, Psalm 98. It's not enough just for people to recognize God. <clears throat> he wants the whole creation, in some sense, to be recognizing God, to be in tune with God, to be relating appropriately to God. And at the end of that final section, 11 to 13, as in the previous two sections, not only in the early part of the section there's this exhortation to praise, but before he finishes the section, he's in a way giving reasons, isn't he? And there are the reasons in the latter part of 13. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Yes, he's already stepped in in saving ways with Abraham and David and many others. Then supremely in his son, Jesus of Nazareth, who is the king. But one day, Jesus' kingdom is going to come to its full climax. One day, the hope of Israel is going to be totally fulfilled. And everything will be put to right. There will even be a resurrection of the dead bodies. There will even be the overcoming of physical death. Of which Jesus, of which Jesus' own resurrection is just the prototype or the, the, uh, the pioneer who's gone through the jungle, as it were. And there's going to be loads more coming out. And he's, and he's saying that kind of thing is a reason for praise. So that's, does that give us a, an overall idea of the psalm? So my overall message is a very simple one, but I'd like to come back to some of those questions I raised at the start <clears throat> in a moment. The overall thing is that the praise of God, that is acknowledging, praising, responding appropriately to the greatness and goodness of God. In effect, praise of God is the number one concern of the whole of life. And I get that partly from Psalm 96 and partly from the rest of the Bible, which is concerned. Yes, concerned that we should know God's love and his forgiveness and be reconciled to him. But insofar as we know his love, forgiveness and his salvation and that he's become our father, we are to thank him and to praise him and to live every part of our lives for his glory as Lynn has been hinting from the beginning of the service. The praise of God in all kinds of ways is the number one concern of the whole world and of the whole of life. So let me come back to that question I asked near the start or that issue I raised. Does God need our praise? And if not, then what's going on? Why does this happen? Uh, and, why, and why is there this emphasis? And I'd like to share 
a little bit from this book written 60, 70 years ago by C.S. Lewis, Reflections on the Psalms. <clears throat> and whenever that topic has come in, that question has come into my mind. My mind has gone back to some extraordinarily helpful paragraph or two in this book. So I'm going, I'm afraid, to read them out. And if it gets too literary and philosophical, I'll try and explain it. Okay? Because I believe C.S. Lewis has, has got under the skin of some of this uh, in his writing here. So in one of the chapters, chapter 9 it is, um, he says this. And he, he makes two points, and one of them is my uh, appreciating Arsenal or my commentaries point, and the other is another point. <clears throat> So his first point is this. He's, I'll read it. God is that object to admire which, or if you like to appreciate which, is simply to be awake, to have entered the real world, not to appreciate which is to have lost the greatest experience and in the end to have lost all. Now what's he meaning there? He's saying, one reason we're to praise God is because God is the most worthy of praise. It says that in the psalm, doesn't it? It says it there, um, verse 4, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared or held in awe above all gods. Me, we might want to praise our new wonderful books from Amazon or the wonderful curtains we bought or our wonderful football team or our wonderful beloved. We might want to praise all kinds of people and things and artifacts. But actually, if we're fully in touch with reality, God is greater than all of these. God has made all of these. The skill of the most skillful footballer. The brain of Johann Cruyff, who made football a far more beautiful game about 30 or 40 years ago. The beauty of a designer or an artist who designs or paints something wonderful. The amazing imagination of a musician who can just, out of it, their brain can come these astonishing sounds that move millions of people. Where does it come from? It's like a miracle, isn't it? Mozart, apparently, if you like Mozart, or you can at least believe that some people like Mozart, Mozart would very often be playing uh, billiards. But while he was playing billiards, he'd have all kinds of tunes knocking around in his head. And he'd occasionally, apparently, he'd occasionally scribble one or two things down on a bit of paper. But not much. And then he'd go home and just write out vast screeds of... Um, Music. He has a he, he holds the world the Guinness Book of World Records prize for the fastest composer, and most of it is worth listening to, 250, 270 years later. What's going on there? Let's praise Mozart. Well, yes, I've just done it, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, where does it come from? It's the skill, the inventiveness. The mind to do that comes from God. God is the great God who is the fountain of all his beauty and skill and wisdom and power and magnificence in creation. And so C.S. Lewis is saying, if we don't praise God, we're just out of touch with reality. The fact that we don't more spontaneously praise God is just, and yet we do praise various other things, is just the fact that we're partially out of touch with reality. The eyes of our hearts are partly blinded. If we saw things as they truly are, we would be saying, yeah, wow, Mozart, wow, Arsenal, wow, a beautiful painting. And then when it came to God, we would just lie down on the floor and roll around in joy and adulation. And in all, we wouldn't know how to express it in, in our present mode of being. We'd be so amazed. That's what would happen. And occasionally, in the pages of the Bible, that's what happens. And God, to some extent, fall on their face, or they're blinded. 
or they can only take it for part of a second. Do you see? So this is C.S. Lewis's point, and I think it's an entirely valid point. And this psalm is just trying to encourage us to see something of how great this God is. It mentions his salvation in verse 2, doesn't it? It says he is to be feared or held in awe above all gods in verse 4. It says the gods of the nations are idols. And the word idols there is a word that sounds a bit like God, but it's not quite God. The word for God is Elohim. And the writer there uses a word Elilim. Not Elohim, but Elilim. Just a tiny bit different. And Elilim means not God. Elilim means non-entities. Nothing. Things that haven't got any reality. And his point is that there is one God who has revealed himself in creation, but also through Abraham and Moses and David and others. And this God is different because he actually exists. And what has he done? Well, amongst other things, he's made the heavens, everything you see in the sky. And our ability to appreciate the greatness of that is greater than the people at the time, isn't it? We have more of an understanding of what that means. We have some vague idea of how vast the universe is. Trillions and trillions of miles of it. And he made it. So the psalmist is seeking to get us to see something of how great he is. Verse 10, the Lord reigns, or the Lord has taken the reins and is now reigning. He has become the king. He, he has become, he always was in charge, but he's become the king in a saving way. And we see that more clearly now that the Lord Jesus has come and has redeemed by dying and by rising again. If you were to say to me, how do we know that this is true? There's lots of ways, but one of the ways is look at the testimony to the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. There is good, solid testimony that he didn't just die on a Roman cross outside Jerusalem, but that he rose from the dead and was seen by many people, overcame death. He is the king. So that's one of the things C.S. Lewis is saying. Uh, he goes on just in that. I'll read the rest of that short paragraph. He says, The incomplete and crippled lives of those who are tone deaf or have never been in love or never known true friendship or never cared for a good book or never enjoyed the feel of the morning air on their cheeks or never, I am one of these, enjoyed football. <laughs> right? The... the the, what he's saying is the, the incomplete and crippled lives of people who have, haven't enjoyed these things. They are just, they just give us faint images of how crippled it is and how incomplete one's life is not to have appreciated and been amazed and praised God, he's saying. So to praise God is to be in touch with reality. It's not in, in a way for God's sake, though it is pleasing to God, it's, but it's appropriate for us. It's not that it's our duty to praise God. Yes, it is our duty to praise God, but that's not the point. If we're not praising God and exulting in God, we're just blind to the most glorious reality there is. That's what he's saying. And that must be so, isn't it? And that's part of what the psalm is saying. And then the other thing I want to share from C.S. Lewis is, is, is the other point. And this is the point about more like um, telling others and uh, the joy of saying something and saying something to others. He says, for a long time, I couldn't get this. I didn't know why Christians were meant to praise God. I thought of it in terms of a compliment or approval or the giving of honor. I had never noticed, though, that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise 
unless, sometimes even if, shyness or the fear of boring others is de deliberately brought in to check it. The world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses, readers their favorite poets, walkers praising the countryside, players praising their favorite game, praise of weather, wines, dishes, actors, motors, horses, colleges, countries, historical personages, children, flowers, mountains, rare stamps, rare beetles, even sometimes politicians or scholars. I had not noticed how the humblest and at the same time the most balanced and capacious minds praised the most, while the cranks and the misfits and the malcontents praised the least. The good critics found something to praise in many imperfect works. The bad ones continually narrowed the list of the books we might be allowed to read, etc., etc. And then he also says, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses, but the praise completes the enjoyment. The praise is its appointed consummation. And so on and so forth. And I think he's right. And he then goes on to imagine, actually, that's, what, that's part of what the world to come is going to be like. That if we can see and appreciate the most glorious God, who is the fountain of all the beauty and the love and the splendor and the wisdom and the magnificence of this world, and if we are in fellowship with him and see him in ways we've never seen him and appreciate him in ways we've never appreciated him before, then actually to be in some way manifesting that appreciation with others, that we can half imagine, will actually be the most glorious thing one could ever experience. You see? So that's the kind of thing the psalm is saying. If you're in touch with reality, you'll praise God. And praising God is not bad for you. Praising God is one of the ways in which you consummate your appreciation and your enjoyment of this magnificent God. Does that make sense? So really, I come on to my last section of thought this morning. We've looked at a tiny bit of the psalm as a whole. I've made those couple of points. Finally, how, how do we do it? And Lynn has given us some guidance earlier in the service, but let me state it this way. Well, let me quote from Hebrews 13, and then state it, this, state it in a certain way. Hebrews 13 says this, and I, I've often thought of these verses, these two verses. I mean, this is page 12, 12. Hebrews 13, verses 15 and 16. The writer says this, talking about two kinds of praise, really. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. What sort of praise is that? Verse 15. Anyone? What kind of praise? What's he talking about? He's talking about the fruit of lips that praise his name. Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. What do you think it's talking about? What kind of praise is that? Singing. Could be singing a song. What else could it be? Talking. talking. It could be talking to somebody else. You see the fruit of lips um, that openly profess his name. So that could be singing, verse 15. It could be telling others, maybe to including telling people who don't yet believe in him. All right? But then read on in the next verse, verse 16. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, sacrifices, see? It's kind of worship language, isn't it? With such sacrifices, God is pleased. So in verse 16, what kind of sacrifice of praise is it? Anybody? Verse 16. What's going on there? What's the sacrifice? What's the kind of praise there? Serving. Yes. Serving others. If we serve others because we believe in God and because God has helped us to love them and respect them, then we are serving others for the glory of God. We are praising God in sharing good things with other people, serving them, helping them in innumerable ways, giving our money to them, whatever else it is. We, 
that is a form of the sacrifice of praise. Do you see that? And, and so it seems to me that those are the, the two most obvious ways that we praise God. We praise him with our lips when we sing to him, when we pray to him, and we praise God when we tell others, including people who don't yet know him, about him. And we praise and worship God in any part of life, in the whole of the rest of the li life, where we are serving or helping or blessing other people. If we do, if we conduct our relationships with other people out of love for them, help us to love them, and we want to honor God by showing them love, then that is worship. Doing our, we might say, well, I, I, I do my daily, I go to the office or I go to my work, I go there, I go there to get my money. And I go there maybe once in a blue moon to tell somebody else about Jesus, if it's not too difficult. But I'm saying to you and to myself, there's a third reason you can go there. That unless your, the work you're doing is of a very peculiar kind, there is some good for other people coming out of your work. You are helping them. You are helping them to have nicer music to listen to, or you are helping them to have cleaner homes and offices to live in, or you are helping them to get them out of legal trouble, or you are helping them to make more money, or you are helping them to enjoy Hampstead Heath more, or you are helping... Nearly every job is helping other people in one way or another, isn't it? Yeah, because otherwise, if it's not helping anybody in any way, do you know what's going to happen? No one's going to pay you. And that means that we can do our ordinary job, not only for the money, and not only hoping that now and then we might be able to say something about Jesus, though that's a good reason. We can also do our ordinary jobs, and indeed we can do lots of unpaid things as well, we can do them for the glory of God. We can serve others in a Christ-like way. We can do it for his honor and praise. And Hebrews 13 says it's part of our sacrifice.